Hey, welcome to Squenchy Yours, initially mine. And this is a show where we look at this week's number one and help you decide whether you should stay in this dimension or find one with better comics. Okay, so, um, we once again sort of have a themed week, and since this has been happening a lot, do you, do you cool cats want me to just sort of list what the theme is when we're done with the episode, because, or maybe at the beginning of the episode? Would that be something that you'd enjoy? Because it seems that we have a lot of themed weeks going on, and I don't know, might be fun. So uh, put down in the comments if that's what you would like me to do, or, uh, put some, or hit me up on Twitter, anything like that. If you guys want it, yeah, I'll do that. I know, yeah, I'm, I'm doing so many, I'm doing such wonderful things for you. All right, so let's jump right in, shall we? Okay, we got a decent number, a decent amount of number ones. We're actually going to start with a one shot, though, which is Beasts of Burden, What the Cat Dragged In. Uh, this is apparently part of a larger um, series. I have not read it, but I will admit that this made me kind of want to read it. Basically, the premise is that the main characters are cat supernatural investigators. They don't, like, investigate supernatural cats. They are cats who investigate the supernatural. Um, the, uh, this, this little one on the cover, uh, she used to be the familiar of a witch who was brought down by the other main characters. Uh, this basically involves her going back to the house with the other main characters, uh, with the help of a raccoon that they needed to open the door, which I thought was kind of clever, um, because she forgot something there. It's... Actually, there's a lot to this. I'm really surprised with it. The characters are believable. As a one-shot, it works because it gives us the information that we need. And it does so without having to do it strictly through dialogue. It does it through um, so through visuals. It, the art and the writing on this really meld well together. In fact, who are, the script is Evan Dorkin and Sarah Dyer. Art is Jill Thompson. Um, I'm... I really do love Thompson's art on this, especially little details like um, just, you know, as I was flipping through, bushes, the leaves on there look really nice. There's enough of them that it feels full without, obviously, her killing herself doing every single leaf. Um, but yeah, this is, oh, this is what a comic really should do in the sense that the writing and the art work together to tell us the story completely. Separately, neither of them really gives us a whole idea, but when you put them together, you end up with something good. I'm not going to lie to you guys. This gets really dark at one point. I mean, like, seriously, seriously dark. Uh, we're, we're talking, you know, reincarnated corpses and having to kill a loved one over and over again type dark. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That being said, thankfully, it doesn't show it to us on the page. It implies it. it. Again, it uses the art very, very strategically to let us know what is going on without it having to be just really gruey. Nobody wants it to be gruey. Uh, well, I guess some people do, but I don't. That's not my thing. Uh, if you do, cool. That's your thing, but then you're not going to find it in this book. Uh, that being said, though, I appreciate the restraint that is put on here that allows me as a reader to fill in those gaps in a way that's going to horrify me more. So, ultimately, yeah, Beasts of Burden, it has a cute premise, and I'm not going to lie and say that it is the darkity dark dark darkest, but it does have some really interesting horror elements to it, and the characters are likable enough that I am willing to follow them into this darkness because I want to see how they get out. So, Beast of Burden. Well worth it. Okay. Along a similar line, Alpha King. Alpha King, is, I bought this actually somewhat excited about it. I normally don't buy Ryan Azarello stuff. He's not my... He's not a writer that I get into. I'm not a big Brian Azarello fan. And this just reminded me why. Um, this is published by Image. Azarello wrote it with Nick Floyd... Uh, that's going to come in handy. Uh, the art and the cover, Simon Bisley. The art is actually really well done. And I'm going to be honest, I liked this first page because it has a couple of demons 
that are arguing over Tolkien and his social implications. I'm like, okay, cool. That That's a good way to start. I'm liking this. Uh, the basic premise appears to be that there is a demon world underneath the skin of our regular world. Um, and while it starts out with a siege of something, at one point it shifts to our regular world where you have a guy who likes to brew his own beer in his garage, and that seems to be his thing. And so uh, he's got a cat and a wife and, you know, the basic thing. And then these demons show up in disguise as regular humans. And most of the book is their torture and murder of him and his wife and his cat all on the page. I, I didn't need to see a cat decapitated this week, but thanks to Brian Azzarello and Nick Floyd, that's exactly what I got. Um, they eventually boil him to death in his own beer, and he wakes up as a demon-looking thing, but apparently he's a monster killer demon. A what? And, uh, cuz. But, no. Here's the part that got me. You know, all the rest of it, it's just standard, gru gruesome for gruesome's sake, whatever. They really like to have blood on the page. That's their thing, that's fine. But then I get to this last page. Since 1996, Three Floyds Brewing Company has built a massive following amongst beer geeks and attained cult status for creating some of the most insane and delicious craft beers in the world. The Alpha King comic expands the world of Three Floyds and unites Nick Floyd with Brian Azzarello, Simon Bisley, Ryan Brown, and etc. Et it's a beer commercial! Ah! A beer commercial! I just read a bunch of slaughter in a beer commercial. First of all, A. Do you not know how beer commercials work? Beer commercials are supposed to be fun and exciting. They're not supposed to be, hey, this is the beer that you want to be boiled to death in. Secondly, did I just pay for you to advertise to me? Did I just, did I spend what I spent on this comic? Did I spend four bucks to read about your, I don't know, blood beer, whatever the hell you make it? Seriously? Hell with you. Ugh. Moving on. Okay, Space Battle Lunchtime. Uh, yeah, this is, this is kind of cutesy. It's not bad. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. Somebody is brought into space in order to represent Earth in basically Cutthroat Kitchen or Iron Chef for space. Um, they, of course, did not know that this was a thing yet. Um, basically, a frog person walks into a bakery and buys coffee for the producer of this show and then, you know, decides that there was a missing person, somebody dropped out of the competition, so, hey, this baker just made stuff, so let, let's hire her. And she goes into space. Um, again, it, it's very cute, very pastel. I don't mind it. It was fun. Um, but I was waiting for something more. Sort of everything was a bit expected. The only thing that was a little bit unique about it was some of the character designs are really clever. Um, I like that the host is essentially a floating octahedron. That was a cute thing. Um, otherwise, it's just, it's very standard spacey stuff, and I'm okay with that. Um, I'm okay with the main character kind of looking at these alien cooking implements and being like, oh, what, what do I do with these? Or opening up the box at the end and seeing the secret ingredient that she's supposed to theme her thing around and having no idea what it is and that's how it ends. I'm not going to say what it looks like, just just read it. So it's not terrible, but there's nothing unique about it. It's, it's, it's Iron Chef in Space. If you like Iron Chef in Space, I think you're going to like this. Otherwise, you probably want to stay away from it. Okay, next. Smosh. 
the kings of YouTube comedy, now in comics. Okay, I, I'll admit, I have not actually watched any Smosh videos, but, I mean, they were, they are, were, are, I'm not sure, are they still huge? Are they still, it's like, them and PewDiePie, and, you know, all of them, and the millions and millions of subscribers, are they still up there? Because if so, great, good for them. Um, I desperately hope that their comedy is better on YouTube than it is in this book, because this book is so astoundingly obvious as to be somewhat pointless. I mean, not only uh, the, introducing the Super Virgin Squad, it, it's exactly what you think it is. It's a bunch of uh, nerdy kids using nerd stereotypes from the 1990s in order to make jokes about how nerdy they are. Um, it's actually somewhat irritating. It's, you know, if you really want to read a comic in which they reuse Saved by the Bell gags, go right ahead. I mean, this is the comic for you. Um, if, you know, you sat there and said, you know what, I think John Hughes' films are just a little too deep and introspective, here you go. Smosh. This is the one. But... Otherwise, all of the jokes are obvious. All of the characters are not just stereotypes, but not even loving stereotypes or playful stereotypes. It's really for us as an audience to laugh at them because they are so silly and geeky. And I don't want to do that. I'm silly and geeky. I am really silly and nerdy as all hell. So why would I want to read a comic in which they're making fun of people like me? Uh, that and some of the choices that they make. Um, I'm not. Sh I'm actually not sure if the writer of this, uh, Michael McDermott, is he a Smosh guy? I don't know. Maybe they just kind of took the Smosh thing and somebody else wrote it. Art by Franco Viglino. I don't. I don't know these people. I'm. I'm sorry. I just don't. What I do know is that. Dynamite Comics pay, and they buy a lot of weird licenses, but they pay for the license for this. Um, see the kid over here on with on the, well, I suppose it'd be on your right, uh, with the teeth brace. First of all, why is he wearing that all the time? Is that a thing that people still do? I mean, I I understand it works and like. Stuff set in the 50s and 60s when orthodontic technology was pretty bad, but considering how they, considering the phones and the technology and the internet and all that that's mentioned in here, this is today. Why, why is he still wearing that? And of course, they have to write in his lisp, making it a challenge to actually read the speech bubbles because it, everything has theaters just thrown in there. Oh man, it's just. This is just, this is just mean-spirited garbage. And there's a backup feature in which it has, um, it's the something neighbor? What's it called? Uh, that damn neighbor. Um, and again, it's, it's stereotypes. In this case, it's a redneck stereotype who buys a great car and he's really clearly jealous of his neighbor who doesn't have any lines and I guess teleports? Maybe, could be, I don't know. It's it's only a few pages of the backup feature, so I don't expect it to be much, but am I supposed to care? Because I don't. Ah! Ah. Moving on. Dungeons and Dragons, Shadows of the Vampire. Okay, this wasn't bad. It's a fairly standard D&D &D style, um... D&D style uh, story. It's actually a sequel, apparently. Um, hold on, it actually mentions it in here. It's a sequel to uh, Dungeons and Dragons Legends of Baldur's Gate, and two of the characters, um, what's his name? Minsk, who's this dude right here, and Boo, his hamster friend, who is not on his shoulder here for some reason, but normally he's on his shoulder. Minsk and Boo are the characters that move over. Otherwise, it's it's your standard D&D &D thing. A party goes to um, a death god's temple, or and the uh, followers there basically ask them to stop somebody from stealing their stuff, 
um, and they get a cleric from of that death god, and you know it's it's got a decent amount of humor to it. Uh, at the very end of it, they end up in another dimension. Specifically, they end up traveling to Ravenloft, which okay, cool, I can buy that. Um, there's a backup feature. But the backup feature, despite having really wonderful art, uh, Tyranny of Dragons it's called, really wonderful art and really great coloring. I love this backup feature as far as the art goes, but the writing is all just these lengthy narration boxes telling me what's happening. That, that bores me. I don't want to read narration boxes all over. Show me the characters. Let them interact. Let them do something. I know what you were kind of going for on this, but... It just did not work. But yeah, if you like D&D um, and you want to just read a decent D&D story, yeah, Shadows of the Vampire Part 1 will kick you into it. You don't need to have seen the original, read the original, because I didn't, but I got what was going on. Um, it doesn't reference it that much, and when it does, it does it in a context that I understand. Um, the characters are all likable. The setup is fine. I actually kind of want to know what happens when they go to Ravenloft. All right. So, yeah. Shadows of the Vampire. Cinema Purgatorio. This is actually a series of short stories um, from various writers. And I happen to like most of the writers in here, so I was excited. Uh, Alan Moore does the main one, the title one, Cinema Purgatorio. Max Brooks does A More Perfect Union, which um, is essentially an alternate history. It takes actual people from the American Civil War and uses them in this story. And I'm kind of interested to see where it goes. I liked the writing on it. And, you know, Max Brooks. So uh, Garth Innes does one. I'm not generally a huge Garth, Garth Innes fan. And this was, actually a, this was actually a really interesting story that he did. It's about an EMT... And they stop a guy who's on fire. They, like, put him out, and you find out that he's set himself on fire, like, three times over the course of the year. And the other EMT knows about this and is trying to talk him out of it. The new girl figures out that he's actually trying to kill himself. He keeps talking about immortality. It doesn't say that he's... It's obvious that he's a vampire. This is very, very obvious, but... It doesn't say that he is until the very last panel when the car when the new girl realizes back at home hours later, he's a vampire, which that was not necessary. We got the idea. I think it was just cooler to imply it, but whatever. It was still, it was not bad. Uh, Christos Gage does The Vast, which is sort of a kaiju story, and I really like Christos Gage. I've liked him since um, what's it, Avengers Academy was when I read him first, and I really enjoyed him there. And then finally, my favorite writer... Kieran Gillen in Modded, which seems to be, um, the story seems to be about, I don't know, I guess fairy people in a, with, in a universe that has a Pokemon-esque battle system, animal battle system going on. It was, it was interesting. These were all kind of part ones. Um, I would say the one that I liked the least was Cinema Purgatorio, just because, Alan Moore was getting a little too into his writing. It was almost almost to the point where he was parodying his own writing, and I, I adore Alan Moore's stuff, but it really got to the point that he was starting to parody his own writing in the writing of this. Um, that being said, though, the rest of them were pretty good. I enjoyed them. I'm looking forward to more. Uh, I really hope that they keep this lineup for a while, or at least enough to finish off all of these stories. All right. Well... Every week, there must be a number one. What was my favorite this week? King's Quest, number one. Now, before you say anything, this has nothing to do with the Sierra games. Nothing whatsoever. Rather, it's a reference to uh, King Comic Syndicates, which... A syndicate sounds really bad, but it just means that they syndicate um, comic strips to newspapers around the country, and it takes a lot of their characters and throws them together. For kids who grew up in the 80s and 90s like me, you might remember Defenders of the Earth. Defenders of the Earth! Defender. Yeah, them. Um, and that was also a bunch of King characters that were thrown together. You had Flash Gordon, the Phantom, um, Mandrake the Magician, uh, 
a guy named Lothar who was uh, Mandrake's like helper, and then you had like four kids, you know, uh, four become eight, defending the year. That yeah, you might have you might have heard this. It was actually a pretty good opening theme, and not a bad show for its time. So when I saw all of these characters together, I'm like, okay, nostalgia. I'll read it. It's probably gonna be okay. It was actually really good. I enjoyed it. Um, Lothar is now the Phantom for some reason, but he's not the real Phantom. Instead, Dale Arden's friend who never showed up in Defenders is the real Phantom, but she hasn't been trained, so she really doesn't know what she's doing. Um, and she's our audience surrogate. She's the one who's there to... Well, they actually used her pretty poorly. She was there to basically scream and throw up and talk about how in over her head she is and I don't care. I didn't... This is apparently a sequel to King Something Else. I can't remember what it was. I have not read the original, but it was also a miniseries and then each of the individual characters got a miniseries. Um, this is not actually connected to Defenders of the Earth except in the characters. Uh, Prince Valiant is in this one. He was not in Defenders of the Earth. Um... Like I said, Lothar is now the Phantom, and Kit Walker is not there. Okay. Uh, otherwise, though, it was fun. It's These are all kind of interesting characters. They are very, very different from one another, and watching their interactions is part of what makes this worth watching. Of course, the main villain is Ming the Merciless, who is a Flash Gordon villain, and always kind of has been in this. And Ming is a actually really good villain to work with. Um, because, you know, with Mongo and with all of that, it, there's a lot to go, there's a lot to go on there. That being said, though, yeah, I, I liked what was going on in this. It's, for a number one, this sets things up well. You didn't necessarily have to read the first one to get it. Um, Jen, whatever her name is, who is the, the new Phantom, the other Phantom, uh, you get the idea that she is Dale Arden's friend. You, If you know enough about Flash Gordon, you even if you don't know enough about Flash Gordon, you know that he has a connection with Dale. You might not necessarily know they were married, but you can at least see that he is the one with the connection. Um, and otherwise, it starts with them crash landing on Mongo, and then the forest attacks them. Uh, I just want to point out that um, the beasts do not call the phantom brother anymore because he was just shooting the hell out of them i mean just blam 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 like aren't you supposed to have animal communication powers wasn't that wasn't that thing you had the phantom <sighs> but yeah still everybody gets their shot everybody gets a little bit of time to show what they can do and to demonstrate why this character is important and how they fit onto the team um, the, they have one story, again, I've talked about this a lot, with a number one, it's important to have a single story arc that you cover in the first issue just to give that amount of closure, and then you hook them for the next story. That's what they did here. The story is they need to find this rebel stronghold on Mongo, that's Ming the Merciless's planet. By the end of it, they do in fact find the rebel stronghold, but then you find out something else which is going to propel them into future stories. That works really well. Um, there was at least one joke in there that really got me laughing, and it's only because I don't want to ruin it for you, so um, I'm going to put the timestamp at the bottom where you can skip ahead to miss this joke. It's just a joke. I don't really want to, you know, it's nothing huge, but... I found it hilarious. But yeah, so skip ahead to that timestamp there uh, if you don't want to hear it. So at one point, Ming's forces... Ming's forces find them in the jungle and they have all sorts of ships and whatnot. And they do some scans and they find Dr. Zarkov's DNA and Flash Gordon's DNA. Well, of course, they are surprised because Flash Gordon is supposed to be dead. And when they show that surprise, my first thought was... Well, Brian Blessed. Gordon's alive. And sure enough, that's in the con that's one of the dialogue boxes. One of the things they say 
is that line, and I know it's dumb. It is really dumb that I care about this, but I thought it was hilarious. Welcome back, if you skip that. Okay, so... Otherwise, yeah, King's Quest does everything a first issue should do. It gives us compelling characters, it gives us a full story arc, it shows what those characters are capable of, it hooks us for the next one without it necessarily leaving the first story hanging. This is everything that you need in a number one, and I think it's worth reading. So, if you like Defenders of the Earth, or if you want to just, you know, walk in with this sort of super team of comic strip characters working together, yeah, King's Quest number one might be the way to go. Okay, so... Um... In case you didn't notice, I am going to mention, you know, whether you want me to specifically point out in the future or not, I'm going to mention that alternate dimensions are totally this week's theme, um, which is strange because I'm also uh, doing listening to a radio drama, like a podcast drama, that just went into an alternate dimension. So, yeah, there, that's a thing. Okay, well, those were the number one for the week. I don't know what your opinion is going to be, but these were initially mine. Take care.